Brahma Chalo Kati Pati Saham Pati Katanjali Anadivara Maya Chata Satita Sata Parachaka Chattika to say to an accompaniment Ajam Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa I'm going to have a look today at one of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya that has a number of points of interest. This is the sutta where uh, the Buddha goes up to the realm of Baka, the Brahma, and has a discourse with him. This sutta is interesting in a number of ways. To begin with, it's Maybe the in the Pali Canon, it's maybe the the most comprehensive glimpse we have of existence in the Brahma world. Uh, the Brahmas are a class of being that are beyond the Devas. They're on a different plane of existence. When thinking about the Brahmas, it's uh, first of all important to understand that uh, the Devas have more in common with us than they do with the Brahmas. We're part of the same level of consciousness as the as the Devas, but not uh, the Brahmas are considered to be on a higher plane. The Devas are part of the sense-desire plane, and the Brahmas are part of the plane of form. They live an immensely long time. The higher Brahmas can live for hundreds of kappas. And there are many different grades of Brahma. This, the Sutta we're dealing with here concerns Brahmas of the first level. Baka is what would be called a, a Maha Brahma, a great Brahma, and he has a retinue of uh, two lower grades of Brahmas in his realm. They are the um, Purohitas, the Brahma Purohitas, and the Brahma Kayakas. Brahma Purohitas are um, the ministers. This would be a literal translation, like the, his assistants or ministers. And there's a limited number of those, and the kayakas are the, the the commonality of the Brahma world. In the commentary to another sutta that concerns Brahmas in the Diginakaya, there is a um, description of how the lesser Brahmas worship the higher Brahma. Uh, and that the commentary is, in some sense, being dismissive of the, of the Brahmas as being deluded. And says they, they bend over like fish hooks in the presence of the great Brahma. Before the Buddha, in the late Vedic religion, the Brahmanical religion, after the Upanishads, Brahma was considered to be a solitary deity and the, the creator, the highest deity in, in their religion. And they also made a distinction between Brahma as a person, which was a masculine noun, and Brahman as a force or a principle in the universe which is a neuter noun and it's perhaps some trace of that is present in the Pali because the 
the word for Brahma is classed as a masculine noun, but it has some some of its declensions take the neuter form. So it's kind of a mixed form. The Brahmas don't have gender. They're not male or female because they have transcended sensuality. They don't have sex and they don't eat in the ordinary way. They only possess the two senses of sight and hearing. So they're an entirely different form of being. They're beyond sensuality. And their consciousness or level of being is considered the equivalent of first jhana for these for the Brahmas of this level. So that means they're beyond the the five hindrances. Although they are subject to defilements of false views and pride and uh, desire for being. So they're not perfected beings by any stretch. Now this uh, this particular Brahma Baka, he had an ancient connection with the Buddha. And the commentary goes into uh, the past lives of Baka. And he spent many lifetimes as a human, as a hermit or an ascetic, developing his meditation. And he used his, he developed psychic powers and he used them for uh, good, for helping beings. And they recount two stories that happened in different lifetimes. One was uh, when um, Baka was a hermit beside the banks of the Ganges River and uh, a boat full of uh, people came down the river partying like a party boat going down the Ganges and people were laughing and playing and they were throwing their rubbish overboard into the river. And this angered the Naga, the, Gan the chief Naga of the Ganges. How do these people dare to foul my river with their rubbish? And he reared up with his serpent form and a giant hood and he was about to crush the boat. And uh, this hermit saw what was happening and he said these people must not perish and he turned into the form of a giant supana these gigantic birds also called garudas that um, are the the enemies of the nagas and he the naga <clears throat> became fearful and swam away and the bodhisattva in that life was one of the people on the boat in another life some uh, bandits had seized uh, some villagers. They took over a village and they looted it and they were carrying a lot of the people away as slaves. And again, this hermit intervened and he conjured up the image of a, a big army, big royal army coming up the hill to catch the bandits. And the bandits just ran away and the people were freed. And again, the Buddha was one of the the villagers. And in the his last human life, the Buddha was also an ascetic and was his student. So he had this deep connection with Baka. Then when Baka died from that life, he was reborn into the fourth jhana level, the, the Wehapala Brahmas. And while he was in, in that form of existence, he grew desirous of experiencing bliss, which is a factor of the third level. And so he practiced third jhana, and he fell down in his next birth to the third level, and then the same thing happened. He was desirous of rapture, so he practiced second jhana and fell to the second jhana level, and then finally he fell to the uh, first Brahma level. Now some people... Hearing that, how he's at, at the higher level, a very sublime existence, and he's desirous of coarser states, they may find that uh, hard to understand, but just think for yourself how many times you're deep in meditation and your mind then drifts off to some coarser form of um, 
imagining or complaining or you know you you know there's a a tendency in the mind that um sometimes is negative and pulls one down from the higher sublime levels to the lower and this is what happened to baka so that's sufficient background I'll get into the the sutta's not not very long, so I'll go through it and I'll stop here and there for to comment on it. It's called the the Brahmana Nimanatika Sutta, Invitation of a Brahma. It's uh, number forty nine in the Majima. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, and at the Pindakas Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus: "Bhikkhus, venerable sir." They replied. The Blessed One said this, because on one occasion I was living at Ukata in the Subhaga grove at the root of a royal sala tree. Now on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in Baka the Brahma thus, this is permanent, this is everlasting, this is eternal, this is total, this is not subject to pass away, for this neither is born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears. And beyond this, there is no escape. So, Baka had fallen into the view of eternalism, which is something we read elsewhere in the suttas that the Brahmas are subject to. Because of their very long lifespan, they, they believe they are immortal. I knew with my mind the thought in the mind of Baka the Brahma, and just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flexed arm or flex his extended arm, I vanished from the root of the royal sala tree in the Subhaga grove at Ukata and appeared in the Brahma world. Baka the Brahma saw me coming in the distance and said, Come, good sir, welcome, good sir. It is long, good sir, since you found an opportunity to come here. Now, good sir, this is permanent, this is everlasting, this is eternal, this is total, this is not subject to pass away, for this neither is born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears, and beyond this there is no escape. Now, Baka greeted him with a phrase, uh, it is long since you have come here, and uh, it's noted in the commentary that this doesn't mean the Buddha had ever been there before. It's a... Uh, common polite form of greeting and it occurs elsewhere in the in the canon as well it doesn't imply that the buddha was ever there before when this was said i told baka the brahma the worthy Bra baka has lapsed into ignorance he has lapsed into ignorance and in that he says of the impermanent that it is permanent of the transient that is everlasting of the non-eternal that it is eternal of the incomplete, that it is total, of what is subject to pass away, that it is not subject to pass away, of what is born, ages, dies, and passes away, and reappears, that it neither is born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, or reappears. And when there is an escape beyond this, he says that there is no escape beyond this. So the Buddha refutes his view of eternalism. And then there's an interesting... Uh, detail occurs, Mara, the evil one, took possession of a member of Brahma's assembly, one of the Brahma Kayakas. And he told me, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu, do not disbelieve him, do not disbelieve him, for this Brahma is the great Brahma, the Maha Brahma, the overlord, the untranscended, of infallible vision, wielder of mastery, lord, maker, and creator, most high providence, master and father of those that are ever can be. So, a couple of things to note here. One is that Bra Mara, who is a, a deity of the Dewa realm, of the highest Dewa realm, was able to occupy the mind of one of the, the Brahmakayakas. And this seems a contradiction because the um, Brahmas are beyond the realm of sensuality. And the commentary does go into this and, and states that Mara's range extends this far to the, the lowest of the Brahma world. Only the very bottom of the Brahma world can he occupy their mind. And he does so 
um, by entering delusion into their mind. He can't tempt them with sensuality because they're beyond that. It's just not in their makeup. But they have the uh, the fault of, of uh, tendency to wrong view. The other thing to note here is this list of epithets of the of the Brahma, and a very similar list occurs in the Brahma Jala Sutta. Um, the, uh, the 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 list uh, of these titles has a very kind of uh, Old Testament feel to it, like the the Father, the Creator, the the um, Providence, and it's kind of kind of uh, strikes me that the whole picture of this Brahma world has a lot of features very much like uh, Christian heaven. More, it resembles that more really than it does the um, Vedic conception of heaven. It's kind of an interesting connection there. The Brahmas are are beings of light. They're because one of their features is luminosity. So you've got Brahma surrounded by all these other Brahmas that worship him, like archangels and angels, and they're all continuously praising him and worshiping him. So then he gets into um, further speech by this lesser Brahma that's occupied by Mara, and he gets into uh, uh, his his position or his argument. Before your time, Bhikkhu, there were recluses and Brahmins in the world who condemned earth through disgust with earth, who condemned water through disgust with water, who condemned fire through disgust with fire, who condemned air through disgust with air, who condemned beings through disgust with beings, who condemned gods through disgust with gods, who condemned Pajapati through disgust with Pajapati, who condemned Brahma through disgust with Brahma. And on the dissolution of the body, when their life was cut off, they became established in an inferior body. So, He's saying that one who is um, develops a uh, a rejection of the elements of being, beginning with earth, air, fire, water, and going through the the, the gods, and Pajapati is a, is a high god in the in the Vedic pantheon. In some versions, he's a creator, and um, Brahma. If they reject these aspects of being they take a lower rebirth. So he's, he's, this is Mara speaking through the Brahma, urging the Buddha to uh, embrace samsara. And he goes on to the contrary position. Before your time, there, Bhikkhu, there were also recluses and Brahmas in the world who lauded earth through delight in earth. And he goes through the same list again to delight in Pajapati and delight in Brahma, and on the dissolution of the body, when their life was cut off, they become established in a superior body. So he's saying you should embrace samsara. So Bhikkhu, I tell you this, be sure, good sir, to do only as Brahma says. Never overstep the word of Brahma. If you overstep the word of the Brahma, Bhikkhu, then like a man trying to deflect an approaching beam of light with a stick, or like a man losing his hold on the earth with his hands and feet as he slips into a deep chasm. So it will befall you too, Bhikkhu. Be sure, good sir, to do only as the Brahma says. No, Never overstep the word of the Brahma. Do you not see the Brahma's assembly seated here, Bhikkhu? And Mara, the evil one, thus called to witness the Brahma's assembly. So Mara is appealing to the consensus of all these uh, Brahma, lesser Brahmas, they're all worshipping the great Brahma. Why don't you go along with it? Submit to peer pressure. When this was said, I told the evil one. Remember, this is the Buddha's speaking first person. I told the evil one, I know you, evil one. Do not think he does not know me. You are Mara, evil one. And the Brahma and Brahma's assembly and the members of Brahma's assembly have all fallen into your hands. They have fallen into your power. You evil one think, 
This one too has fallen into my hands. He too has fallen into my power. But I have not fallen into your hands, evil one. I have not fallen into your power. When this was said, Baka the Brahma told me, Good sir, I say of the permanent that it is permanent. And again, he goes his his uh, rant about everything being, uh, or his existence. He's actually referring to his own existence, his, his eternal, his existence in his realm. And um, he says, before your time, Bhikkhu, there were recluses and Brahmins whose asceticism lasted as long as your whole life. They knew when there is an escape beyond, that there is an escape beyond. And when there is no escape beyond, there is no escape beyond. So, Bhikkhu, I tell you this, you will find no escape beyond. So he thought his existence was the ultimate. And eventually you will reap only weariness and disappointment. If you hold on to earth, you will be close to me, within my domain, for me to work my will upon and punish. You know, that's... That is always strikes me as a very odd phrase. Like this is an inducement to be his follower. You know, do as I say and hold tight to the elements of existence, and then you will, uh, you you will be mine to work my will upon and punish. I take it to be like a threat. And the commentary actually says the punishment would be rebirth into a, a dwarfish and deformed body. And then the Buddha replies, I know this too, Brahma. If I hold to earth, I shall be close to you and within your domain for you to work your will upon and punish. If I hold to water, to fire, to air, to beings, to gods, to Pajapati, to Brahma, I shall be close to you and within your domain for you to work your will upon and punish. Furthermore, I understand your reach and sway to extend thus. Baka the Brahma has this much power, this much might, this much influence. Now, good sir, says Baka, how far do you understand my reach and sway to extend? And then the Buddha replies in, this, in verse, As far as moon and sun revolve, shining and lighting up the quarters, over a thousandfold such worlds does your sovereignty extend. And there you know the high and low, and those with lust and free from lust. This... The state that is thus and otherwise, the coming and going of beings. Brahma, I understand your reach and your sway to extend thus. Baka the Brahma has this much power, this much might, this much influence. So he's first stating how much the sovereignty or, or power and knowledge of Brahma extends as over a thousand world systems. The world system being uh, Chakavala. Mount Meru, the four islands, and the sun and the moon. And a thousand such of these is within the sphere of the Brahma. So that's a pretty uh, powerful and uh, vast expanse. And this is a point I like to recall when talking about jhana, because remember that this consciousness of these Brahmas is the equivalent of uh, jhana in a human being. So often people make the mistake of thinking with the meditation that they're trying to narrow their mind to a point, and that's completely wrong. The mind with samadhi is vast and expansive. And just as a Brahma can contemplate a thousand world systems. But the Buddha goes on, after it defined the limits of Baka's knowledge, which is some considerable space he then goes on but Brahma there are three other bodies which you neither know nor see which I know and see there is the body called the gods of streaming radiance from which you passed away and reappeared here that's the Abhisara Brahmas of second jhana level because you have dwelt there long your memory of that has lapsed and hence you do not know or see it but I know and see it. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Because I know more than you. There is the body called the gods of refulgent glory. That's the Subakina Brahmas of the third level, equivalent to third jhana. 
There is the body called the gods of great fruit, Wehapala, the fourth jhana level. You do not know or see, but I know and see. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. So the, the Baka has no inkling of that these realms even exist. Brahma, having directly known earth as earth, and having directly known that which is not commensurate with the earthness of earth, I do not claim to be earth. I do not claim to be in earth. I do not claim to be apart from earth. I do not claim earth to be mine. I did not affirm earth. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. So now the Buddha is getting directly into his own understanding. And he is uh, saying in the, the, the very first uh, line of this, he says, having directly known that which is not commensurate with earthiness of earth. And that the verb or uh, uh, commensurate with, or verbal phrase commensurate with, is uh, a difficult uh, translation, and there's some discussion in in the in the, the footnotes here about that uh, the use of that word and what, and what he the Buddha is actually referring to that which is not commensurate with with earth is nibbana. The Buddha is saying because I know the unconditioned that which is not partaking of of the element of earth, then I know more than you. You do not e even conceive of, of that. And he goes through that saying, um, I do not see myself as earth or of the earth or apart from the earth or with the earth. So Nibbana is completely outside of all of these conceptions. And he goes through and repeats the same thing with um, this whole long list, the four elements, and then through the various gods, and he extends it through to the gods of the higher, uh, the higher realms as well, the, uh, the gods of the uh, Abhisara, Subakina, uh, Wehafala. And further, he says that he doesn't identify with the overlord as the overlord, as the all in all. Having directly known that which is not commensurate with the allness of all, I do not claim to be all. I do not claim to be in all. I do not claim to be apart from all. I did not claim all to be mine. I did not affirm it. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not merely stand at the same level as you. I know more. This, this whole passage is... Um, very similar to a passage in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, which is the first sutta of this collection, the Majima, where the Buddha goes through almost identical list, beginning with the four elements and then through various things, various levels of gods, then up to the allness of all. Um, and analyzes them in terms of how they are perceived or held in the mind by beings with different levels of understanding. And he, he uh, compares the, the, in this sutta, he compares the, the approach of the patujana, the seka, and the aseka. The patujana is a, um, literally means the common folk. This is the uh, people who have not attained to any state of awakening. Uh, the seka means a learner or a student, and it's someone who has um, at least stream entry, but not yet arahantship. And the, the aseka is the arahant, the non-learner. He doesn't have anything more to learn. He's done. It's like the grad, grad student or graduate. So patujana, seka, and aseka. And the... Um, the Patujana 
identifies with the um, all these various elements, and his he perceives them. He uses the verb sanjanati, perceives. He sort of perceives earth, and what he perceives, he conceives. Manyati. So then he spins ideas in his mind based on his perception. But then the seka, he directly knows the verb is abhijanati, earth, water, fire, air. But he's still subject to, and he should make an effort not to conceive manyati. He's still subject to possibility of conceiving, you know, spinning of the mind. And the commentary goes on to specify what's meant by abhijanati in this case. Direct knowing of earth or water or whatever means that he sees the three characteristics in them. But he's still subject to uh, mental conception and, and running off the rails. But the arahant, he directly knows, but he does not conceive. He, he does not manyati. So this is a very similar passage. It's a little bit different language. And the Buddha is more, in this passage, in the invitation to Brahma Sutta, he's more um, comparing his own sublime understanding and his uh, um, experience of the unconditioned relative to all these things up to the highest, the all in all, which uh, I see in that a... Um, a reference to the Upanishadic view of the the one the one mind. The Buddha says he sees through all these things as conditioned. Good sir, if you claim to directly know that which is not commensurate with the allness of all, this is Baka speaking again. Good sir, if you claim to directly know that which is not commensurate with the allness of all, may your claim not turn out to be empty and vain. And then the Buddha replies in verse. And this is a very important uh, verse. It occurs twice in the in the canon. Uh, um, a slightly different version, which I'll in the in the diga, which I'll also reference here. Now this is um, uh, Nyanamoli's translation, or this is this was translated by Nyanamoli, and then revised or edited by Bhikkhu Bodhi. The consciousness that makes no showing, nor has to do with finiteness, not claiming being with respect to all. Now, before I get into it, I, I'm just going to give you the, uh, this is uh, Maurice Walsh's translation, and it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, a, there's two verses here. This is from the Kavada Sutta, which, uh, um, very briefly, I'll state the story of the Kavada Sutta, is that a bhikkhu wants to find the answer to the question, where do earth, air, fire, and water cease without remainder? And he's wondering in his mind where, where this might be. And so he says, well, I don't know. Maybe I should ask the gods. And he uses his psychic power to go up from level to level through the various hierarchy of the heavens. And like he goes to Tawatinksa and then the Tawatinksa God say, says to him, we don't know, but maybe the Yama gods know. And so he goes upstairs and he, you know, he keeps going up until he reaches the level of Baka, or not Baka, the, it's a different Brahma, but he reaches the Brahma world. And uh, the Brahma gives him the same uh, routine as in, in this sutta. He goes, I am the great Brahma, I am the mighty, the all-powerful, and you know, this, and this bhikkhu says, yes, that may be very well and good, but you didn't answer my question. Where do earth, air, fire, and water cease without remainder? And finally, uh, the Brahma, this is kind of a humorous touch, you know, that the, the Brahma takes, takes the bhikkhu aside and says, look, I don't want to embarrass myself in front of my assembly. I have no idea where, these, where they cease without remainder. Why don't you go, you know, you've got the Buddha in your realm. Why don't you go down and ask him? <laughs> so... So he goes, he goes back to earth and he asks the Buddha and the Buddha's reply is, you're at, uh, to start with, is you're asking the wrong question. 
you should ask, where do earth, water, and fire no footing find? Where are long and short, small and great, fair and foul? Where are name and form wholly destroyed? And then the answer is, and that this is the same, this, the, like the second stanza is the same as in this sutta, but the translation is different. Where consciousness is signless, boundless, all luminous. That's where earth, water, fire, and air find no footing. They're both long, short, small, and great, fair, and foul. Their name and form are wholly destroyed. Their the cessation of consciousness is destroyed. So, consciousness is signless, anidasana, boundless, ananta, all luminous, sabato, pabang. And um, those three terms are translated here as makes no showing, signless, makes no showing. Uh, boundless is not having to do with finiteness, which is kind of a unnecessarily a wordy way for it. The, the Pali is ananta, just like one word, it's a boundless, without limit, literally limitless. So the enlightened mind is, first of all, it's signless, anidasana, it has no indication it has no uh, you can't name it or find a sign or a reference to it it is boundless and the last phrase is the one that's difficult of translation and um, there have been several uh, beginning with the commentaries provides like three different possible translations but I think Maurice Walsh's is the most direct from the Pali. The Pali is Sabato Pabang. And Pabang means, um, amongst other things, it means luminous, having light. And Sabato is, is all, everything complete. So all luminous, I think, is probably the, um, the original intention. So the, the enlightened mind or the awakened mind has these three characteristics. It's signless, boundless, and all luminous. Then the, after the Buddha declares this verse, then he goes on, that, meaning this liberated mind, the mind that knows the unconditioned, that is not commensurate with the earthness of earth, it is not commensurate with waterness of water, it is not commensurate with the allness of all. Then he says, uh, then the, the, the Brahma says, Baka, good sir, I shall vanish from you. Now this is a little um, brief, this episode is a little brief in the sutta, the commentary goes on to say that, or explains it as, uh, a lalitika, a game or a contest. Baka was proposing, we'll see who really is the mightier being here. I'll give you a, you know, we'll give a contest. And I'll vanish from you. And you won't be able to see me. And then you won't be able to vanish from me because I can see all. So the Buddha, of course, he takes the challenge. Good, uh, vanish from me if you can, Brahma. Then back of the Brahma saying, I shall vanish from the recluse, recluse Gotama. I shall vanish from the recluse Gotama. Was unable to vanish. to be a bird, do you? Baka, so you want to be a bee. Is that why you're buzzing around the flower palm? Baka. 
Ka, do you not want to enjoy the happiness of the Brahma realm any longer? Is that why you have made yourself so fine and mixed yourself with the sand grains on the sea floor? I grant that you are capable of finding me, but now it's your turn. If I can find you, then I will admit that you are the Omniscient One, one more all-seeing than me. Thereupon I said, Brahma, I shall vanish from you. And again, the commentary fleshes this out. It says that the, that the Baka tried to vanish three times. Uh, the first time he made the uh, resolution to revert to his natural state uh, with the implication that he was in a coarser state to relate to the Buddha and his natural state would be invisible to lower beings. But that seems a bit contradictory to me because elsewhere it's clear that the Buddha, is, with the Buddha Chaku, the divine eye of the Buddha, uh, he can see into all realms. But in any case, in the in the commentary, it says he tried to change to his natural state and the Buddha used the psychic power to prevent that. Then he um, created the Baka, created a great darkness. And the Buddha penetrated the darkness with his light. He emanated light and dispelled the darkness. And then the, the commentary takes it to a... a Point of comedy, of low comedy. It says that Baka, running out of further uh, further measures, fled from his palace and tried to hide behind a tree. <laughs> and his, uh, his and this this led to merriment of his followers who uh, started mocking him and saying, "Is this the great Brahma crouching behind the tree?" <laughs> so the the commentaries are not entirely without a sense of humor. So, getting back to the sutta, it says, and again, we're, this is the Buddha speaking in first person, then I perform such a feat of supernormal power that the Brahma and Brahma's assembly and the members of Brahma's assembly could hear my voice but not see me. Whatever world system, whatever universe you've concealed yourself in, please show yourself. Baka, I did not conceal myself in any world system or universe. All the time that you were searching for me, I was walking up and down above your head.
After I had vanished, I uttered this stanza, having seen fear in every mode of being, and in being seeking for non-being, and in being seeking for non-being, I do not affirm any mode of being, nor do I cling to any delight in being. So the Buddha is declaring he, that he's beyond bhava tanha and we bhava tanha, the desire for being and the desire for not being, because he sees every form of being is marked with the three characteristics, and seeking for non-being is also uh, another way of engaging in, in the samsaric game. At that time, Brahma and Brahma's assembly and the members of Brahma, Brahma's assembly were struck with wonder and amazement. It is wonderful, sir, it is marvelous that great power and great might of the recluse Gautama. We have never before seen or heard of any recluse or Brahman who had such great power and great might as this recluse Gautama who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Sirs, though living in a generation that delights in being and takes delight in being, that rejoices in being, he has extirpated being together with its root. So they're, they're amazed that anyone could uh, not delight in being. Because this is a characteristic of Brahmas, that they're very full of being. You know, they've be, they're mighty beings. And that they, you know, they, they don't have sensual desire. They have this desire for existence and power. And they can't imagine anyone's gone beyond that. Then Mara, the evil one, again took possession of a member of the assembly, and he said to me, Good sir, if that is what you know, if that is what you have discovered, do not guide your lay disciples or those gone forth. Do not teach the Dhamma to your lay disciples or to those gone forth. Create no yearning in your lay disciples or in those gone forth. Before your time, Bhikkhu, there were recluses and Brahmins in the world claiming to be accomplished and fully enlightened and they guided their lay disciples and those gone forth. They taught the Dhamma to their lay disciples and those gone forth. They created yearning in lay disciples and those gone forth. And when their life was cut off, they became established in an inferior body. So Mara is saying, you know, don't, okay, you know this stuff, but you know, don't, don't spread it around, teach it. You'll just make more trouble. Because you just get people's hopes up and then they'll get, They'll, that'll develop a different kind of craving and when they die, they'll take a lower birth. So better just not teach. Now, before your time, Bhikkhu, there were also recluses and Brahmins in the world claiming to be accomplished and fully enlightened and they did not guide their lay disciples and, and they created no yearning in their lay disciples and those gone forth. And on the dissolution of their body, they became established in a superior body. Be sure, good sir, to abide inactive, devoted to a pleasant abiding here and now. This is better left undeclared, and so, good sir, inform no one else. Mara uses this this line on the Buddha elsewhere too. He says, "Okay, okay, I know you know. I know you're fully enlightened, and you know the way to to full enlightenment. But you know, at least don't teach it to anybody else." <laughs> When this was said, I told Mara, the evil one, I know you, evil one. That's always what the Buddha says when he's confronted by Mara. I know you, Mara. Do not think he does not know me. You are Mara, the evil one. It is not out of compassion for wel their welfare that you speak thus. It is without compassion for their welfare that you speak thus. You think thus, evil one. Those to whom the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma will escape from my sphere. These recluses and Brahmins of yours, evil one, who claim to be accomplished and fully enlightened, were not accomplished and fully enlightened. But I, who claim to be accomplished and fully enlightened, am accomplished and fully enlightened. If the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma to disciples, he is such, evil one. And if the Tathagata does not teach the Dhamma to disciples, he is such. Meaning that the Buddha is Tathagata, he's fully enlightened whether he teaches or not. It's not going to change his state of being. Why is that? Because the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, that bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future rebirth, aging, and death. He has cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, 
done away with them so they are no longer subject to future arising. Just as a palm tree is cut off as incapable of further growth, so too the Tathagata has abandoned the taints at the file, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Thus, because Mara was unable to reply and because it began with the, Buddha's in, with the Brahma's invitation, this discourse is entitled on the invitation of a Brahma. So somebody, I can't, I was trying to remember who said this. I was one, I may have been Bhikkhu Bodhi in one of his uh, notes. Um, said that in this sutta, the Buddha meets God and the devil and defeats them both. <laughs> <laughs> So, as you can see, this is a very, very interesting sutta with some, uh, some profound dhamma in it, and when the Buddha is speaking to very elevated beings, so to brahmas, so his his teaching has got to be at a very high level, yeah. and we have this, this really. Uh, a wonderful description of the the awakened mind in in three clauses four if you add the the one from the other sutta uh, no footing found so no footing found signless boundless and luminous so that's the um discourse of, in of imitation to a brahma the main driving question that I have about this sutta, there's a lot of them, but the main one I think, yeah. uh, the reason that I requested this talk is because I'm interested in there's two moments where the Buddha responds to Mara. There's very two crucial responses. Yeah. One of them is very clear, that response about uh, consciousness without uh, surface is how Tanisro translates it in the newer uh, edition. Oh, that... oh uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I, could you read out the, 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 um, Tanisro's translation? I... Uh, I, I've got, this is Tanisro's right here, yeah. um, and this one is a, a more recent edition with Bodhi, and Bodhi actually changed his translation there as well. Okay. Um, in Bodhi's translation, the, the newer translation he did, he said consciousness non-manifesting. Okay. Uh, boundless, luminous all around. Tanisro's translation... Well, so he does then he does go revert to luminous. Yes. Yeah, yes. good. Okay. Um, and in Tanisro's translation, he says, consciousness without surface, endless, radiant. All okay. Around. So they both keep the light thing, but there's, um, when I read uh, this edition's note on it, he noted how he had changed his translation in the newer one. Yeah. Um, he went into, how, like, why there's difficulty around the word. Yes. Um, the difficulty is they're, they're inferring it from a context where the Buddha used this term to express how space was not an appropriate medium to paint on. Uh-huh. So it's not entirely clear. To me, sort of just goes, well, just no surface. Um, Bodhi's just like, well, it's not clear that that's exactly what it means, but it definitely means yeah. that not a good spot to manifest. Yeah, non, non-manifest or uh, signless. Uh, yeah, I, I think... Without surface, that's a bit too, I don't know, too concrete. I, I can, I can, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know Polly, um, so I, I can't comment. Um, but the thing that, uh, that's, the, that's the section that I'm most interested in. The one at the end, I'm also interested in because it's a little less clear how the reply is going on here. Uh -huh. Um. But in each case, what I'm interested in is why, in each case, that constitutes a reply to what he's accusing. So in the first one, he's saying, uh, this is the more recent edition of Bodhi, Good sir, if that is not partaken of by the allness of all, 
may it not turn out to be vacuous and empty for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, why is this a response to that, uh, that, that sort of contemptful uh, accusation or comment or whatever? Well, the way I would read it is that Baca is, is basically saying, uh, you know, basically accusing the Buddha of just blowing hot air, like you don't know what you're talking about, you may it not be just empty words. And, and then the Buddha is declaring that he does know what the awakened mind is, and he describes it. Right. Um, so would that be to say that uh, the awakened mind is not just a concept? Yeah, it's a... It's it, the Buddha is not just talking empty, vain theorizing. He's like he actually lives that. And, you know, he's saying, "I know this mind is boundless. It's it's luminous and it's it's signless." You mentioned in uh, that this sutta is related to the first sutta in the Majjhima. Yes, Kaya. yes, um, and that it's that. What people are trying to do, the, the higher learners, yeah. is in directly knowing things yes. to not conceive about them. Yes. Do you think that there's a possibility that the Buddha is accusing Mara in turn? Uh, of, of conceiving? Yes. Yeah. So this brings me to the, the, the next bit. At the end of this sutta, Mara is speechless. Yeah. Why do you think he's speechless? Because he's run all his, he's shot all his arrows at his quiver. He's, he's first tried, you know, he first tried to, uh, his first uh, attempt was to get the Buddha to submit to, to Baka. And, you know, that, of course that didn't work, you know, so that's kind of a feeble, feeble attempt. And then he tries to um, refute him with this uh, philosophy about uh, holding on to the earthiness of earth and so on, like the essence of things. Yes. And then the Buddha refutes that. And then his final ploy, which he, he uses elsewhere in the same sort of thing, when he, his last ditch attempt is, okay, you win, you know what, you know the truth, you know the way out, but you know, just don't keep it to yourself. Yes. <laughs> you know? And the Buddha refuses that too, so now he's speechless, he's got nothing more he can do. So, I'm just trying to get to the actual What do you make of this bit where he says, um, I just want to find it exactly here. If the Tathagata teaches the Dhamma to disciples, he is such evil one. And if the Tathagata does not teach the Dhamma to yeah. disciples, he is such. Yes. Yeah, well, the Buddha is saying, um, as far as his own being concerned, the, the Buddha, you know, I, I'm the Buddha, I'm the Tathagata, and whether I teach or I don't teach, I'm still the Buddha, I'm still the Tathagata. It doesn't affect me. So why do you think he would find that relevant to say to Mara at that point? Um... Well, he's making the point about uh, um, the teaching is out of compassion for the students. Like he's t he's accusing Mara of, Mara of having false compassion. You're saying you know don't teach because you'll just get people's hopes up and then they'll fail and they'll be miserable. And the, and uh, the Buddha says you know, that's you have false compassion. And uh, so the it's it's clear elsewhere that the Buddha is teaching only out of compassion. But he doesn't gain anything from teaching. He's still the Tathagata, whether he teaches or not. I think that's... I think that's true. But I, I, the thing that I wonder about is why he has to stress that teaching isn't going to affect what he's attained. Um, because Mara, it seems like yeah. there's a bit of a cycle going on here. Like, first he's yeah. going like, no, dude, life is great. Hold on to the earth, hold yeah, on to the yeah, water. Yeah. And then after he's really persuaded him that he's not going to do that, he basically goes, okay, well, 
Please just stay out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the, I, I just, I don't, I don't see it that such a, I, I don't see that there's any sort of uh, difficulty there. It's just the Buddha just declaring, you know, I'm the Buddha whether I teach or not, but I'm going to teach because it's out of compassion helps people. I like these, uh, I actually like these stories about Brahmas. I think that they're kind of uh, fascinating. Beings who have gotten beyond all the stinky, messy biology of the, of the lower realms. And they're just pure being. So when the Buddha is poking fun at the Brahmas, yeah. is he also poking fun at the Brahmins? Is that what he's doing? Um, in a in a way, kind of indirectly, because uh, the the Brahmins are always uh, uh, like they worship Brahma, the god, in their conception of Brahma, and they're seeking the way to Brahma. So. This is the um, the Buddha, you know, taking their their God and, sh and saying, you know, your God is is foolish. He doesn't understand everything. He thinks he's God, but he's actually just a being like everybody else. In the first uh, Sutta in Majima, the one that's related to this one, yeah, um, it's uh, when I was reading on this. Um, Cody mentioned that it's not just that uh, uh, the list of uh, non-identity, it's, it's not just that parallel, it's also yeah. the area that he gives the, the exposition from is the, on, the only other sutta where he gives that exposition is that oh, really? first one. Oh, so I, they are very really much connected. Okay. And, and the thing that Bodhi noted, I don't know if it's in the sutta or not, but it, it might be in the commentaries, but apparently the people he was talking to at the end of that sutta, it says they did not delight. In yeah, this. I think no, that's not this sutta. It's the Mula Pariyana. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. The, yeah. So I think it's the one sutta that they it says that at the end. Yes. Did not delight. And the the reason that Bodhi mentions is because he was speaking to Brahmins. Yeah. Ex Brahmins who had ordained under him. Yeah. And he was basically like wiping away the last of their religious sentiments. Right. Right. Milena. This is Milena. <laughs> You're gonna be a star, baby. And this is Antia, member of the board and the master of green tea ceremony. This is green tea, pre made, okay. and this is water if you want something different from green tea. Okay. And we have Ajahn well, Shaharu. By the two merits. <laughs> And let's see again our request of the talk. There are a couple other questions I had. Um, we probably didn't have the budget for special effects like that. <laughs> In Majima 1, he talks about how the higher learner uh, is supposed to directly know things mm -hmm. and to stop. The, the discipline is to stop conceiving things. No. Um, with the goal that when they become an arahant, they will fully understand the phenomena and yeah. no longer conceptualize them, but so perceive. Mm -hmm. um, now, the thing that I found notable was the Buddha, he describes the arahants, how they, they fully understand things. But when he describes his own understanding, yeah. he changes it. Yeah. He says, uh, Bhikkhus, the Tathagata, too, accomplished and fully enlightened, directly knows earth as earth. Having directly known earth as earth, he does not conceive himself as earth. He does not conceive himself in earth. He does not conceive himself apart from earth. He does not conceive earth to be mine. So there is a rejection of identity with, in, apart, or in possession of. Mm. Uh, and then he says, 
Uh, oh, and also he does not delight in earth. And then he says, why is that? Because the Tathagata has fully understood it to the end. Mm -hmm. He changes it. He tacks on this to the end. Yeah. Right? Um, that puzzles me because he doesn't give any indication of how the knowledge has changed. It's the exact same formula. Yeah. Do you have an idea of what um, he might be hinting at? The knowledge of a Buddha is said to be incomprehensible and goes beyond that of a Arahant. There's so like other contexts where, um, uh, for example, there's one passage that talks about how many how many previous lifetimes different uh, different levels can remember, and the maximum. For I forget the numbers, but it's something like you know a maximum that a. Uh, a an ordinary arhat may not remember any, but if he has the psychic power of remembering, he might remember 10,000 lifetimes. And a great disciple can remember up to 100,000. The Pacheka Buddha can remember up to a thousand kappas. But there's no limit to how, how many lifetimes the Buddha can remember. So, this, this kind of thing led to the... Um, in the commentarial period, the Buddha was ascribed omniscience, sabanyuta, which he never claimed for himself. Um, but it, it is often, not just in this passage, but elsewhere, that the Buddha will distinguish like his, his knowledge is, is greater or vaster than that of an ordinary arahant. It's a distinguishing quality of a Buddha. There's, and it, there's a, a sense of it being without limit. So, would you say that what he's hinting at here is not internal to this particular discussion? So, like, and what I mean yeah. by that is, he's talking about how there's a lack of identity. He does not identify with phenomena. He yeah. does not identify himself as in phenomena does not identify himself as apart from phenomena, and he does not identify phenomena as in his possession. There's a symmetrical relation between the Arahant and him. Yeah. So you would say that this bit that he's tacking on at the end, this to the end bit, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's sort of a, a peripheral consideration, like, oh, and by the way, there's a lot of other stuff that I know too. Yeah, like the Arahant understands the emptiness of, of the of earthiness, the, the Buddha understands it to the end, meaning it, you know, it's like totally, completely comprehended. So it's like, a, it's the same understanding, but deeper or more penetrating. Mm 